So the one thing that uh, I'm going to send out sometime this week is a good visual breakdown of what the Smith Maneuver is, just so you guys know. Um, I'm going to share throughout the process kind of a little simple visual that I have prepared from an old PowerPoint presentation. But um, we're mainly going to focus on going through the first three chapters of the book, which many of you won't have the book. So I've painstakingly rewritten kind of the Coles notes with the examples. And um, I'm going to go through that, kind of break down how it works, what the results are, talk a little bit about what's changed with the strategy. And um, the goal is going to be to give everyone kind of a functional understanding of how the strategy can be applied. And then in the following events, we're going to break down those specific applications and really dive into maybe we'll pick a few uh, guinea pigs out of the crowd and um, we'll go through a couple Smith Maneuver Calculator um, breakdowns, which I think will be good to give some real world examples where I'll let some people volunteer if they want ahead of time. I'll prep them a little bit what they'll need to know. And then we can actually run through the calculator in real time with a real individual. But in the meantime, does anybody have any questions? Well, how fast can you turn around a 25 year mortgage uh, to get it writable? Oh, um, I would say best case scenario I've seen is about six and a half, seven years to make it fully tax deductible. But that typically requires investment properties and cash damming. So you got to come up with cash. No. So the fastest way to make your mortgage fully tax deductible is to own one or two or three investment properties. You take the gross revenue, so rent before expenses, pay down your mortgage in your home, then you reborrow the rental property's expenses, and you can make your mortgage fully tax deductible in you know, six, seven years, depending on the size of it, right? If you got one of those Vancouver monsters and you got a $3 million mortgage, well, it's probably going to take a little longer. If you live in Alberta, you can probably do it in three years, two years. Yeah, well, I'm thinking, well... I'm doing something different. I'm I'm like you. I'm we had a conversation. What I'm looking at, and uh, I'm looking at some room and uh, whatever, and it's up there. But uh, the other one, what I've got in mind is uh, my kids at this point in time. I don't know how it's going to how it would work with them. So that thus I'm in trying to learn about it. I love how you're here looking for your kids. <laughs> well, you know, hey. They could be running my operation. They don't want to. We actually see a lot of that. It's one of the things I chat my clients about when it comes to the estate planning side is who's going to run the business in a sense, who's going to deal with the CRA tax bill. And um, often one of the things we'll see is that none of the kids want to run the investment properties, even if they're paid off and there's no real problems with them. So. Well, I don't know whether it's a case of not wanting to, but they've got a life and they got kids and they got, you know, trying to get themselves established and, and entertainment and, you know, trips, whatever. And uh, I'm retired, so I play and I still get to travel. Oh, I totally understand. Well, well, we'll start in a couple of minutes, everyone. Got one more minute and then we'll dive into this. Um, so the email that I sent out is going to have the breakdown of, uh, I'll get to you one minute, Damien. Um, the email is going to have the breakdown of what we're going to be going through. I'll jump into a couple of visual things quickly, and we will go through the first three chapters of the book. Anyone who hasn't received one can expect one very soon because they all hit the mail today. Well, not all, but the, the next 98. And then there's about 35 of you left. That will go up Saturday. Uh, so we've got multiple investor focused realtors and coaches and specialists in the room. So uh, someone's asking if there's any good resources for assessing investment properties. I have a spreadsheet to break down the basic level of the numbers of the property, but they're depending on the markets you're in, there's a whole range of tools you can use to analyze like demographic changes. Uh, economic changes, job growth. There's lots of cool stuff you can look at. Uh, another cool one is the OCP or the, the plan of a municipality to change the zoning and density. Uh, looking at maps for proposed transit can be another good way to look. I think personally, the goal should be to try to figure out trends that are happening in a city or a neighborhood that the public is not onto yet or are far enough in the future that the large investment REITs can't start buying up the land yet. So usually I say more than five years, the five to 10 year window is the sweet spot where a REIT or any type of publicly driven company, they can't afford to buy something and sit on it without earning returns for four or five years. So sometimes there's a window there. Cool. 
Cool. Well, let's dive into this. So the everyone should have the email, but at the end of the day, we're all here to talk about the Smith Maneuver. And uh, the core of the Smith Maneuver is a strategy to create tax deductibility. It is to pay off the bad or expensive debt on your home and to replace it with tax deductible debt, which has a lower cost and enables you to create investments for retirement. So there's two real pillars to the Smith Maneuver. There is, call it wealth creation, where you're borrowing to invest. And then there is debt conversion, which is where you are simply borrowing to convert debt. You're not creating new investments, but rather just replacing non-tax deductible debt with tax deductible debt. So the whole goal of the strategy is to allow you to save for retirement sooner, because the classic method that most Canadians are using is pay off your mortgage. Sometimes it takes a very, very long time or forever. And then once your mortgage is paid off, really, really focus on saving for retirement. Many will try to do both at the same time, but it's paying your mortgage impacts your ability to save for retirement because it takes cash flow away from that. The whole goal or purpose of the Smith Maneuver is every dollar that goes towards paying off your mortgage can also go towards saving for retirement. And this allows Canadians to essentially get two birds with one stone, and it can make some really, really significant impacts in your retirement planning and savings. We're actually going to go through an example with a $200,000 mortgage, and it's pretty crazy the impact it can have over 25 years. Um, so that's kind of the gist of what we're going to be discussing. Ultimately, the goal is to pay off your mortgage as fast as you possibly can by diverting cash flow towards paying off your non-tax deductible mortgage. And then reinvest and invest as quickly as you can to retire one day. The, I wonder, should I just screen share this? This might be easier. Sorry, buddy, we're making this up as we go. So the idea though, is that this creates kind of a win-win situation where you can save for retirement and pay off your debt faster. So the, you a couple of people. You need to talk, just unmute yourself. Are you screen sharing? I'm not screen sharing yet, but I will. Um, the one thing I am gonna screen share right now, I'm doing this on a single screen, there we go. So this is really the basic, basic concept of the Smith Maneuver for anyone who can't wrap their heads around it. You've got a large non-tax deductible mortgage balance. You've got, call it a $1 HELOC. Over time, as you pay down your mortgage, the balance of that non-tax deductible mortgage diminishes, the limit of your home equity line of credit goes up. Over time, that limit keeps rising. And as it rises, you're investing, you're borrowing and you're investing into the stock market, a business, real estate, private lending. There's a broad selection of options and there's professionals that help with this. That's not my wheelhouse, but what I do wanna do is break down kind of the basics of the strategy. Ultimately, you pay down your mortgage, you invest, you get your tax returns, you rinse and repeat, and you just keep cycling it. Now, the first chapter is just a really basic introduction to this. So if you go through the book, you can skim through it pretty quickly. It just kind of covers the theory of it. The second chapter, once again, not super important. It just breaks down kind of the backstory. The idea is that the rich and wealthy people in Canada and the States, there's certain tax rules, tax loopholes, benefits that the wealthy get that us poor folk generally don't. Um, the idea of the Smith Maneuver is to create a system where we can at least benefit from some of those things, primarily tax deductibility and how cash flow can be manipulated to improve essentially your financial outcome. The nice thing about the Smith Maneuver is that at least theoretically, if done correctly, it does not require any new money. So unlike many of the other strategies that you'll see presented, velocity banking, uh, infinite banking concept, there's quite a few retirement strategies, but they ultimately require you need to find money to put towards your retirement from somewhere. The nice thing about the Smith Maneuver is at least in its most bare bones capacity, the only thing you have to do is pay your mortgage payment. If you make your mortgage payment and things are controlled correctly, that will then cause the rest of the strategy to move forward. So you do not need to come up with extra money to pay for your investment HELOC if you implement the strategy in kind of the most bare bones way. 
There are other ways that you can do it as well, which have better outcomes or you end up with a larger net worth, but sometimes they do require additional cash flow. Um, the third chapter, which is really, I think, where things start to get interesting, and you guys should have the email, is where we start to get into the examples, where in the situation of a $200,000 mortgage, we can get some pretty substantial increases to net worth, crawling towards the $2 million mark. I think the important thing to note, though, is that the examples with the 7% interest rate. So I know one of the biggest concerns that many people have is <gasps> rates are rising. And does it still make sense? Well, the question people arguably could have been asking five years ago was rates have dropped so much, does the Smith maneuver still make sense? Because when it was created, rates were 10%. When the book was written, which is a few years after the strategy already started to exist and circulate, rates were 7% in the example. Um, one thing to note is in the example, which I actually called Robinson Smith to check with him earlier today, just to triple check that was the HELOC rate that people could borrow at was actually lower than their mortgage rate. So I don't know about you guys, but I would love to be in a time where my mortgage is actually more expensive than my HELOC and I can borrow for 2% less. Um, it doesn't change the math a major way in the strategy. And we'll go through one of the next sessions through the actual calculator to show real world examples of today's market and climate. But the important thing to know is that if you're not sure on the strategy and how it'll impact you, then there is a calculator and there is a link in what I sent out full disclosure. If you, uh, if you buy the calculator, I think I get like three bucks or something silly. Um, but if you want to run through the numbers yourself, it can be worth it. If you're a professional and you want to have that to kind of gauge whether you're going to suggest a strategy, it is really useful. I know that Julia and I, and I want to say Andrew all have access to it. So if you do want to ask, if you don't want to pay the money and you want someone to run you through it, if you ask one of the three of us, I'm sure if you ask nicely, we'll help. Um, the one thing I want to avoid is last time I did this, I had about 75 people ask me to run through the calculator and it takes an easy 30 minutes. So um, I'm scapegoating a couple other people. But most importantly, the example that we had, so it was a $200,000 mortgage. So they called this the Blacks. I don't know if you're allowed to refer to families, the Blacks, or the Browns or anything anymore, but uh, the book used the blacks and browns as an example. We are going to just look at the black situation because the browns version is a hundred thousand dollar mortgage, and I just don't think those exist anymore unless you live in maybe Turtleford, Saskatchewan. Um, but it's a two hundred thousand dollar mortgage with a twenty five year amortization, five year term, which doesn't really matter to the math of this. The interest rate on the mortgage is seven percent. They're paying it down and reborrowing at 5%, which isn't quite realistic to today's numbers. Realistically, you're going to be reborrowing today at 6.7 to 7.2%. But there are a few strategies we'll dig into that you can use to bring the overall cost of that investment debt down. I want to just go through the basics today, so we'll go through that in a future one. The investment return they're using is 10%, which is higher than what I use with my clients when we're going through numbers. I personally prefer seven to eight percent. I would rather your expectations are low and you get better results than, you know, 10 percent still below the average return in the S&P 500 index. But I, I think you want to go into the strategy with a conservative and cautious approach rather than all the money you're going to make. The details of this situation, there's a couple other things that are important. One is that this household was making $500 a month into non-registered investment contributions, which is going to tie into a couple of the accelerators. These are things that you can do to optimize your situation and cash flow to get better results. They have $30,000 of non-registered investments, and then they have a $20,000 nest egg. So the first level of the strategy, and Julia, if it's quiet in your area, I'm going to pull you in just to uh, get a little redundancy here for anybody learning, is the plain Jane Smith maneuver. This is level one, as basic as it gets. It's not optimized, but it is the core of the strategy, which is they make their mortgage payment. It causes their home equity line of credit to have some room on it. They then take that room they have, they reborrow it, and they put it into some sort of investment, earning 10%. Every time they make their payment, they repeat this. The second level of the strategy, which I think is really important, is by doing this, you're going to create tax deductible debt, which is going to create tax deductions and reduce your overall tax bill at the end of the year. You're going to get those savings. 
you take those savings that you get from the CRA, you prepay your mortgage with it, and you reinvest it. Now, why this is important is because this will start to shrink your amortization. In this example, that one little step shaves two and a half years off of how long they're making payments on their mortgage that's non-tax deductible. The cool thing about this is even with this little dinky $200,000 example, just doing these two basic steps of the Smith Maneuver gives them a net worth increase of over $200,000. So I imagine that if anyone came to you and said, hey, you can do something that's gonna take 10 minutes a month, and in 25 years, you're gonna have an extra $200,000 in your tire. I imagine most of us would be pretty interested in what that 10 minutes a month is. So that's the core of the strategy. Julia, did you hear me? Do you want to spit that back if you can? Sure. I got a little bit of background noise here because I had to step into a Starbucks on my way home here to jump into the call. So yeah, so uh, the layman's term on that would be you have your typical mortgage payment, you have your readvanceable mortgage. Um, it, every time you make a mortgage payment, you've got some room on your HELOC and you're reborrowing and putting it into an actual investment. Um, and the beauty is that last part that Keaton made reference to is your when you get your tax credit based on your tax deductibility, um, so you get a big paycheck, it's from CRA at the end of the year, you take that check and you put it right back into your mortgage. So it decreases your um, the amount of years that you have on your mortgage to pay off. How's that, Keaton? Good awesome. little summary? Yeah. I'm going to drag you along through this. I can get a little head in the clouds some days. So now we can do better. There are ways to optimize the strategy. And my advice is that if you're going to implement the Smith Maneuver, you want to optimize it as much as you can. Because generally, the primary risk of the strategy is the leverage aspect. Most of these optimizations do not increase the risk of the leverage significantly, but they do increase the reward of the strategy overall. So the next piece is what's called a debt swap. This can apply with or without the Smith Maneuver's monthly aspect. And this is where you have some sort of cash that is non-registered. So this can be just cash in the bank. It can be anything that is, in, is not in a TFSA, an RESP, an RRSP, or any kind of pension layer, et cetera. So you take this non-registered investment. In this case, it's $30,000. And then they have their $20,000 rainy day fund. And what they do is they prepay their mortgage with it, and then they reborrow it and they replace those investments. A couple notes you have to be careful of. One is prepayment penalties when you do this. Two is tax implications of liquidating those non-registered investments. And the last one is you can actually use this strategy to what's called tax loss harvest. If you have a non-registered investment that has lost value, if you sell that investment, you create a tax deduction because you lost money. So in that scenario, if you pay down your mortgage and then you reborrow, you cannot buy that same investment for a period of time. Ultimately, you should talk to an accountant or financial advisor about this. Please do not do any of this strategy without having experts kind of guiding you through, because I'm not going to say it's super complex. It's certainly not super simple, but most importantly is there can be silly little rules that may apply to your situation, but don't get covered generally. That can be pretty significant. The nice thing, though, is by making that one extra step, by doing that $50,000 debt swap, they go from a $200,000 net worth increase to a $1.2 million net worth increase. There is a massive jump in the results because it causes a snowball where the investments happen yeah. faster and faster. Just muting a couple extra people. Um, but so once again, the debt swap in its most basic sense is if you have non-registered money, cash, it's in a shoebox, it doesn't matter, non-registered investments, an inheritance. You can take that money, pay down your mortgage with it, then borrow and reinvest. So there's going to be a common theme here, but Julia, do you want to uh, do the uh, breakdown? The honors of being a lay person? Yeah, so this is a nice one because often people will have extra cash lying around and don't realize that as much as you're putting it onto your mortgage, it doesn't mean it sits in the mortgage. It means you're allowed to reborrow it and use it to invest in something. And I'm just going to sum up just to be super lay person, the prepayment penalties and tax implications can apply. So this is something you would absolutely want to talk to an accountant and preferably a Smith Maneuver certified accountant. 
which do exist, by the way. Yeah. So Julia, Andrew, and I have access to the whole network. So if you need anyone, just let us know. Um, another important thing to know is that part of this example, the, the family, they're taking their rainy day fund, their savings, and they're paying down their mortgage with it, and they're reborrowing it to invest. I'm not going to say it's wrong, but I will say that it's higher risk. So myself as an example, I use this version of the strategy because I'm young, I have a higher risk tolerance, because I've created a broad base of investments through the Smith Maneuver, I have the ability to pick and choose from certain investments and hopefully something's not terrible. But most importantly, the book uses the example of having an unsecured line of credit as a safety net. I want everyone to know that that is not a foolproof scenario. In the darkest days of the economy, in some sort of scenario where the world starts to go really bad, economy's crashing, things suck, your investments have plummeted 50%, lenders can call unsecured lines of credit and they can call home equity lines of credit. So there's always a chance the bank says it's gone. So personally, I think that if you want to have a, if you have a lower risk tolerance, you probably wouldn't want to use your rainy day fund and do this. But each to their own, we want to go through the examples, break down the books. I'm not going to agree with everything in the book, and this is one of them. Situationally, it can be okay if you're really, really stable. But if your risk tolerance is lower, wouldn't do it. Keaton, can I ask a question? Just For to sure. throw a spin in here. So if someone had a good portion of their mortgage already paid off and they're running into this situation, would you... Um, I'm not gonna say advise because I know you need to understand the complexity of the situation and where they're at, but would this be something they could consider um, to kind of uh, accelerate having the mortgage paid down and have some other money come back out so they can start investing like, let's say in a rental property if they wanted a, a down payment. Are you payment. referring to pulling equity out of their home? Uh, no, I'm referring to a, like a debt swap. Let's say someone had a good portion of their home already paid down so because a lot of people are coming into the Smith maneuver not even realizing they could have implemented this so they still owe on their mortgage but they do have some good savings and they want to accelerate paying off their mortgage and start taking that money to invest would the debt swap be something that you would say hey that you know put that extra money down there and pull it out and go for it for sure. The debt swap is one of the accelerators that I would say makes sense in the most situations. Because at the end of the day, you maintain the same level of debt, whether you do it or not. You have the same investments. You just create some tax deductibility. So your investment risk is there no matter what. You're investing in whatever you're investing. Your debt risk is there no matter what, because you've already got that debt. Um, so I would say that, yes, it is one of the things that we look at most for clients. and. I wouldn't say it applies more or less to someone if they've paid off their mortgage, if they have less debt. Um, one of the things, though, that I do situationally point clients at and have them dig into is if your rainy day fund is in a GIC, and let's say it's a redeemable GIC, and this day and age is earning 3%. I don't know. I, I don't know the market rates, but you can look it up. Sometimes the math makes sense to debt swap that GIC anyways. Because you're taking your rainy day fund, you're paying down your mortgage, you're reborrowing, you're recreating the rainy day fund with that same GIC. It does not always mathematically make sense, and we have to do a calculation there, but call it 50% of the time, it is beneficial. So there are situations where you want to keep that rainy day fund, you want to have that really safe investment, let's call it a GIC. Um, there's another thing you can look up called GIC laddering, where if you want to put money into GICs and you want a low risk, Sometimes what people will do is they'll say, okay, I have $100,000 to put into GICs and I want to optimize my returns while maintaining flexibility. Paraphrase GIC laddering and saying, okay, how much money do I need given 30 days notice? Let's just say 10 grand. You put $10,000 into a redeemable GIC, you can access that within reason at any time. Then they go, okay, how much money do I need, worst case scenario, with three months notice? Maybe it's $25,000. So they put $25,000 into a three-month GIC because that's going to have a slightly higher return. And they stagger the money they put in GICs based on how quickly they reasonably think they'd need it. Because the longer you lock money into a GIC, the higher the return it pays is. And this can give you a high degree of flexibility 
while giving you a higher overall return than just putting your money into one flexible product. So that's my little aside. I'm not a financial planner. Please talk to an expert. Just get excited about this stuff. So once again, the debt swap in this example brings over a million dollar net worth increase. I'm a believer that when you look at the Smith maneuver, anytime you start to see six figure net worth improvement, great. It shouldn't be a quest of, can I make it 2 million? Can I make it 3 million? I'm a believer of, are you okay with the risks of the strategy? Is it moving you in a positive direction? Personally, I'm a believer that the Smith maneuver should complement your investment strategy rather than replace it. So it can be something that can accelerate it, but generally speaking, I wouldn't suggest the Smith maneuver is all you do. It's something that can accelerate what you are already doing. And I think that's an important thing that people get lost on. The next piece of the book that I think is kind of cool to consider, because this is all about optimizing things, is the cash flow diversion. So the cash flow diversion is where this couple, they're taking $500 a month and they're putting it into a non-registered investment account. We can make that a little better. We take the $500 a month, we pay down the non-tax deductible mortgage with it, then we reborrow it and invest it. So we get the same debt overall, the same investments. We're just optimizing things to maximize tax deductibility to get out of that non-tax deductible mortgage faster. Uh, a little addition I'm going to add that's in the in Robinson Smith's book, but not Fraser's, is the dividend diversion. So in the event, let's say you've got you've done the debt swap, you've created fifty or hundred thousand dollars of non-registered investments. Some of them may pay dividends. There's something called a DRIP, which is a dividend reinvestment plan. And essentially that automatically reinvests your dividends into whatever stock you've purchased. But there's a better way to do it. And it's called the, it's a diversion strategy. So you get your dividends, they go into your account. Before you reinvest them, you take them, you pay down your non-tax deductible mortgage, you reborrow them, then you reinvest them. So there's a theme. Anytime you have some sort of cash flow that is ultimately going to go to investing, at least in a non-registered capacity, it's generally optimal to run it through your non-tax deductible mortgage first and reborrow. Because the goal is to wipe that mortgage out as fast as humanly possible. Occasionally, there's speed limits, which are called prepayment penalties. And we have to do a calculation to see if it's beneficial to pay those prepayment penalties or if it's better to slow your prepayment down so you don't cross that line. Typically speaking, the gauge I use for that is sustainability. If you've got a $500,000 mortgage and you're allowed to pay $100,000 per year without penalty, and you've got $150,000 of cash, you're not going to be sustainable. If you throw $150,000 at it day one, you're going you're gonna to trigger a penalty on that $50,000 of extra prepayment. Year two, you've got no extra money to prepay. So typically, it's better to stagger it out, prepay the $100,000, just invest your $50,000 in whatever it may be. You have to gauge the risk of that because it could drop. Year two, your prepayment resets. You take the 50000 you prepay. Off you go and you avoid penalties. So it's important to um, consider how you do it. Uh, one of the questions we're getting from Melinda is, is it better to put money into a TFSA rather than running it this way? And that's where the advisors get involved. I don't think there's a universal answer, but I would say generally, I think maximizing your contributions to your tax-free savings accounts is important. One of the Smith Maneuver certified accountants that I work with has even made the statement to at least me personally that he believes so strongly in the tax-free savings account that he believes in borrowing to max your tax-free savings account generally, even if it means you don't get tax deductibility on that debt. He thinks it's that important. Now, this is very blanket advice. Your situation may be different. But Melinda, I would say that if you're in a situation where you have to choose between, um, let's say the dividend diversion or maxing your tax-free savings account, it's, it's a serious consideration. You should be considering both. Generally speaking, the, and they actually use an example, I believe in the second chapter, where when the book was written, there was rumors that the CRA may override tax deductibility on investment debt. And they make the point that two thirds of the benefit of the strategy are getting money invested sooner. One third of the strategy is tax deductions. So situationally, and this is kind of advanced stuff, but we can structure home equity lines of credit on your products or the HELOCs. We can create two or three. Some lenders will do five. One lender will do 99. 
you're almost never going to need that, but typically three to five is enough. We will actually structure the home equity lines of credit sometimes for one to be for non-tax deductible, uh, renovations on your home, fixing your teeth, your kid's university, or situationally putting money into RSP or TFSA accounts. So again, want to be really clear. Situationally, it can make sense. But generally speaking, you're going to want the advice of a financial advisor and an accountant in this situation. Please never do this on your own because there can be repercussions. You can mix the debt. You can cause issues with the CRA. I've seen stories of clients over-contributing on your TFSA. And if you think the CRA is expensive, wait till you over-contribute on a TFSA. They charge a percentage of your account every month, and it is expensive. Um, but to summarize, the cash flow diversion is you take any cash flow you have, let's say money you're going to put towards investment savings, you run it through your mortgage, then you reborrow and then invest. You can also use dividends to do this in non-registered accounts. If you borrow in yes. your HELOC to put into your Lira or your RSP or your TFSA or your RESP, it's not tax deductible. I wanted to make a comment about that TFSA. Um, I think it was Linda that asked about that. Um, you know, if we go back to Keaton's comment about what the purpose of the Smith Maneuver is to help accelerate where you're at. So if TFSA is something that can is also accelerated, I believe in diversification. I don't believe in having all my eggs in one basket. So the, it's definitely a question for your investment advisor or your accountant. But there is that fine line of should you be putting everything in one place or should you be building two eggs at the, or boiling two eggs at the same time? So just, I just wanted to put my five cents in there. And moreover, a lot of people will put money into a TFSA, but if you're not doing anything with it, it's really not advantageous. So it's nice to build your TFSA and get it maxed up to the, I think it's 86,000 right now. That's awesome, but you've got to be doing something with that money. Otherwise, it's, it doesn't matter that it's um, non-tax, that it's tax deductible. So. Yeah, one of the biggest misconceptions of the tax-free savings account is people think it's a savings account and they leave cash in it and they don't invest it. It's an investment account. And um, one of the things I wanted to touch on is if you own rental properties, there's a way that you can divert your cash flow to borrow in a tax-deductible way and put money into RSPs or TFSA. So caution, double black diamond need your accountant and your financial advisor for this one. But if you own rental properties and you have room on your home equity line of credit, what you can do is every month you're going to get a rent check from your property. That rent check comes in, you set it aside. You just put it in your account. It sits there in cash for purposes of example. You're going to have to pay your mortgage, property tax, insurance. So what you do is you borrow on your home equity line of credit. You've got that room. You use it to pay for the rental property. So now you're covering the expenses of the rental property in a tax deductible way. You've got this cash, this, let's say, $4,000 rent you've collected. But you can use the rent and you could pay down your mortgage and repeat the cycle of the Smith Maneuver. Or in this example, if you wanted to put, if you want to max your tax free savings account, you take the four grand rent from the property, you put it in your TFSA. There's no issues with that. So there are ways that you can manipulate the structure. But the big thing to know is that if you pay down your mortgage and you borrow and you put it into any type of registered account, TFSA, RSP, RESP, et cetera, it's not tax deductible and you cannot mix that borrowing with your tax deductible borrowing. So typically speaking, the cash flow diversion is used for non-registered investment contributions, but sometimes people will use it to put in their corporate structures to free up cash flow. And there are ways that the stuff can get more advanced and that you can manipulate the numbers, but that requires some pretty high level planning. Um, so my advice is keep it simple, stupid, start with the strategy, keep it real basic. As you get comfortable with it, as you get familiar with the professionals you're working with, and as they get to know your situation, you can then gradually start optimizing things. So many of my clients, when we set up the right mortgage product for the Smith Maneuver, which is a re-advancing mortgage, we will do nothing for three months after we set it up. And they just sit there, la di da And I let them just stew on what they're going to be doing. Then we talk again. And if they're comfortable and they feel good about it, great. You know, even if they've got $200,000 room on their home equity line of credit, I say, whoa, 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 hold up. Let's just take three months and you do the plain Jane Smith maneuver. You borrow the $1,000, $2,000 a month you pay down in your mortgage. You re-borrow it. You invest it. 
great. You've three months later, you've put roughly six thousand dollars on your HELOC. You've invested six thousand. Then we have another talk. Julia, how are you feeling? Have you guys been stressed? Are you checking your investment account three times a day? These are typically warning signs. Um, at the end of the day, it's ideally a very, very long-term strategy. If you're two years from retirement, almost certainly this is not the right strategy for you. If you're 22 years from retirement, it could be a good fit. And I think the best thing you can do is get the right professionals involved. And the more you can ignore it, the better. I'm not saying ignore your finances, don't keep track on things, but it's not healthy to be looking at your investment account every day. It's a long-term retirement strategy that if you've got a one-year timeline, two-year timeline, if you're expecting crazy results in three, four years, it's generally not there unless you get really lucky. And at that point, you're gambling. So one of the things we're going to do is when we go through the Smith & Calculator, we're actually going to look at the graphs that show the net worth creation. And sadly, you're going to see most of it happens in the last five, 10 years because that's the power of compounding interest. And the longer it sits, the better. So you see these as an example, the cash flow diversion and the example leads to almost a $1.9 million net worth increase. If you shave those five years off, if it goes from 25 to 20 years, it might be a, I don't know, $400,000 net worth increase. I have to look at the calculator to see exactly what it would be. But the important thing is that time is what makes the strategy successful. It's not super aggressive real estate investing. It's not super aggressive investing in the stock market. It's time. So if any of you guys have any questions, we're going to kind of unpack these three chapters. This is where we're going to draw a close for the book for this time. Um, I believe there's 12 chapters in the book, so we're roughly a quarter through it already. The next step we're really going to focus on is how this strategy functions. It's one thing to talk about kind of what you do. I think the next step is to look at how you do it what it actually looks like, what it means for you on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, but for now, if anyone's got any questions, uh, we can jump into it. If there's anything, uh, Andrew, Julia, any of you guys want to add? Um, otherwise, open mic, let's chat. Well, I, I'm just going to add uh, the levels of which uh, they have accelerators now compared to what it was when, when I did it. Um, <clears throat> I found it fairly, um, when I did it, I was fairly plain Jane, rental properties, cash damning, that type of thing. I found it, um, it was a super powerful tool even then. And I didn't do what Julia was saying about taking my tax refund and throwing it down on my mortgage and things like that. Like I, I, I felt like, holy crumb, I missed large swaths of opportunities. Um, that are now uh, very much highlighted, um, but it needed to be done correctly. That was the one thing I remember my accountant telling me, this is before there was an organized system, shall we say, is it's gotta be done correctly because CRA is looking at, you know, real estate investors now and making sure that they're, do they're doing everything the right way. So, um, if you think you can do it on your own, I would think twice about that. I definitely, I don't care if you guys never, ever talk to any of us in the room, just make sure you work with an accountant. This is, this is not something to go do on your own. Uh, Robinson created the Smith Maneuver Certified Professionals Problem or Program for one main reason, and that is there are so many horror stories in the strategy. People hear someone talk about it. They quickly Google it. They read three lines on it. They go do it. And, and it's not just an accountant. It's an accountant that understands how this actually should be done. That's 100%. really important. And I'll share an example with everyone. I had a client that wanted to implement the strategy and their CPA, Charter Professional Accountant, called me. This lady reached out and said, hey, I'm working with so-and-so. I want to touch base. Uh, clients interested in the Smith Maneuver. And I don't like it. I said, oh, okay, no problem. It's not for everybody. What's your concern or issue with it? And she says, well, I don't like the idea of selling the home to the corporation. It just never makes sense. I, I'm, I don't agree with it. And I said, oh, well, that's not the Smith maneuver. I, I'm not sure what that's called, but it's selling your home to your corporation is absolutely a tax strategy, but it's not the Smith maneuver. 
And she said, yes, it is. And I said, no, it's no, it's not. I've, I've got the both books with five feet away from me. Like I, I know that it's not the Smith River. And she started arguing and telling me that she owns two accounting firms and she's been doing this for 25 years and she's the accountant. And uh, I finally won the argument by saying, would you like me to dial the author of the Smith Maneuver book into this call? She started to realize that one, I personally knew the author. And two, I was really confident I was right and I was willing to pull the author in and I never heard from her again. The client isn't working with her anymore because he realized that this person was going on in a very, lots of confidence, no understanding whatsoever. So one of the things I suggest if you're ever interviewing a professional is ask them open-ended questions. Hey, Andrew, when you're utilizing the Smith Maneuver um, and you're cash damming, how do you get your clients to minimize the risk? And if Andrew, the accountant, is knowledgeable about it, they're going to either be able to clarify your question because maybe you asked it poorly, or they're going to be able to answer it. But if they're like, uh, cash damming, what do you mean? That's a red flag that they don't know the Smith Maneuver. Um, something else I was going to add that I don't remember. So uh, one of the questions that came up, though, was that in the book, uh, so in the book, the example, the home equity line of credit they're using is at 5%, the mortgage is at 7%. Um, so yes, that, that is an example that doesn't apply directly today. Normally, the home equity line of credit is more expensive than the mortgage. And then what we can do is something called the Fraser Finagle to bring that investment home equity line of credit cost down. Simply put, when the home equity line of credit for investment purposes gets relatively large, we talk our clients through calling up their bank and locking it into an amortized mortgage. This now gets the same interest rates as non-tax deductible mortgages because the bank doesn't know the difference. It's just a mortgage. But this is why it's important to work with a lender that has multiple mortgage and line of credit products available in their product because it lets you make the little changes to cut the interest cost off your tax deductible home equity line of credit by maybe 2%. And then at the end of the day, if let's say at the perfect halfway point, you've got $250,000 of non-tax deductible debt, $250,000 of tax deductible debt. Using today's numbers, maybe your mortgage interest rate's 5% on the non-tax deductible mortgage. Maybe the home equity line of credit's 7.2, which is currently prime plus a half based on today's rates. If you're at a 25% tax bracket, we got to do the math to see what the borrowing is. It's possible the home equity line of credit after tax deductibility could still be more expensive than your mortgage. But if we can lock that home equity line of credit into a 5% mortgage, now the cost is substantially lower. And it is important to know that once again, in the book and in the real world, typically speaking, one third of the benefit of the strategy is from tax deductions. Two thirds is getting money invested sooner. So there are situations where for short periods of time, it can make sense to pay down your mortgage, borrow and invest, even if the overall cost of interest is 0.1, 0.2% higher after the tax deductibility. That's something where you're going to need to do an analysis with a professional and they can tell you based on your situation what makes that sense. But a couple examples where it never makes sense is if you're cash damming. If you're taking the rental revenue from your property, from an investment property, you pay down your mortgage, and then you reborrow to cover the cost of the rental property. That's strictly a debt conversion strategy. It's not creating any investments. It's not creating any growth. It's simply moving money to create tax deductibility. But hypothetically, if you have a mortgage for 2% from a year ago, and your home equity line of credit 7.2%, it's generally speaking, not a good idea to do that. Because even if you're at a 50% tax rate, your 7.2% mortgage is going to cost 3.6 after tax deductibility. 3.6 is still a lot higher than 2%. Now, where it gets more complicated, and this is where the professionals actually have to do some work, is, well, what if you owe a million dollars? What if it's going to take you 15 years to make your mortgage fully tax deductible? Realistically speaking, that 2% mortgage is going to renew in three, four years. It's going to go to whatever market rates are long-term the interest cost on your home equity line of credit is probably going to average out relatively close to the interest cost on your mortgage. So there are layers to the strategy, layers of how it should apply to you. So please don't take anything I say and go, okay, this is the way it is. Therefore, I should do this. This is more to educate all of you to get a general understanding of the strategy and figure out how it works and to decide, hey, I like how this works. I like how this sounds. I'm now going to talk to professionals and make sure it's a good fit for me. 
just going to dig through. Okay, here we go. Next question. Is there any advantage? Is there any advantage to having a readvanceable mortgage on a rental property? Um, yes, absolutely. So by having a readvanceable mortgage on your rental property, you're going to create a safety net or a contingency fund that's there always. So for my really OCD clients, the best way I explain it is, hey, you like to keep everything in a neat little box, right? So when you go buy your rental property and you need a roof or you need to do some repairs, there's a vacancy, you want to make sure that you keep everything associated with the cost and operation of that property tied to the property. Usually they say, yeah. So if something comes up and you need to spend $35,000 on a roof, well, instead of needing to borrow it on your credit cards or having cash set aside for it, imagine if you just had a $43,000 home equity line of credit tied to the rental property. You borrow, you fix the roof, that's now tax deductible. It's all nice and neat to organize. So it creates defensive benefits because you're creating a safety net as you pay down your rental property mortgage. And it also creates offensive benefits. You're now creating room that you could borrow to invest and buy, as an example, more real estate investment properties. So if you can only save $2,000 a month or $1,000 a month, it's going to take a very long time to build your down payment. If you pay down the mortgage on your home and that creates another $1,000 a month, it's going to cut the time in half. But if you've got two investment properties that also pay down $2,000 a month, you can see how very quickly you start to build meaningful down payments. So in that example, you'd have $48,000 a year that you could use to create another investment property. Now, the one thing I want to clarify, though, and I wonder if this is where the question's going, is can you implement the Smith Maneuver on rental properties? The short answer is no, because the debt on your rental property, the mortgage that was used to buy that rental property, is already tax deductible because it is debt that was used to purchase an asset that provides an income. It creates a return. So one of the biggest mistakes that I see people do is they're taking all these steps and motions. They're paying down their rental property mortgage. They're reborrowing it. They're investing it. Unless there's an interest rate difference or some sort of reason why you want to pay down that mortgage faster, there's no benefit to it. They'd be better just to let that mortgage pay itself off naturally. So just make your minimum payments. If you want to borrow to invest, there's no problem with that. Just make sure it's reasonable risk for you. You can borrow and invest. But forcing extra pay down on your rental property, there's no benefit unless, and this is one strategy that I'm using personally, I locked in the mortgage on my home, but this would apply whether it's your home or a rental property. I have a re-advancing mortgage on my home and I have a HELOC. Now I was able to negotiate a HELOC rate of prime. So currently it's 6.7% and my mortgage is locked in at 5.09. If at any point in time, interest rates drop, so my worst case scenario with a fixed rate mortgage, other than a massive prepayment penalty, is rates drop to, let's say, 3%. Now, I'm really pissed off. I feel like a schmuck. I locked in my mortgage at 5%. My neighbors just got 3%, and I got two and a half years to go. Well, what I can do is I can use my home equity line of credit at prime, so maybe it's 3.7% or whatever it is, and I can pay down my mortgage with it. This does not make the borrowing tax deductible because I'm paying down non-tax deductible debt. But what it does is it gets me out of that 5.09 and it moves it over to whatever prime is. So there are ways that you can use these re-advancing products to really manipulate the numbers of your portfolio or to minimize the risks of, let's say, locking in. Another example where a re-advanceable product would be really useful in a rental is let's say you took a five-year fixed and you're selling the property halfway through. You've got this line of credit that's built up and you go to the bank and say, hey, hey, Mr. Banker, I'm going to sell. And they go, oh, okay, no worries. It's a $25,000 penalty. Well, if I have 20% prepayment on that mortgage and I have room on my line of credit, on any line of credit, what I can do is borrow in the line of credit, prepay my mortgage the 20% the day before I sell the property. And what that's going to do is reduce the penalty on that mortgage by 20%. So in this case, that would save me $5,000. So there are ways where these products can be used outside of the Smith Maneuver to just be good investors. And they can be used to improve the returns of your investing by lowering your overall costs. Not everything's about the Smith Maneuver and tax deductibility, but rather treating real estate investing or treating your investing like a business owner 
and stacking the deck so no matter what happens, you're in the best position possible. Just gonna go through the last three of these questions. Would you try and lock in the rate on the line of set credit after it's maxed out? Situationally, the benefit to the line of credit is that you get to make interest only payments. The two main drawbacks to having the line of credit is one, it's generally more expensive than a mortgage rate. At least a closed variable mortgage is almost always cheaper than a open line of credit. The second disadvantage to having a line of credit, whether it's a home equity line of credit or an unsecured line of credit maxed out, is that if you go over 50% of the limit, it starts to pull your credit score down. Now, home equity line of credits tend to impact your score less than credit cards or unsecured lines of credit. But at the end of the day, having a maxed out line of credit for a long period of time could drop your score 20, 30 points, potentially more for the credit score. By locking it in, you can reduce the cost and you can eliminate that credit impact. Um, generally speaking, I would say it's worthwhile unless you plan on selling soon. But one thing you need to be aware of is the moment that you lock it in, you have to pay principal and interest on that debt. So your payments are going to go up. Your interest cost will go down, but your payments go up. The workaround to this is if that mortgage you lock in is also readvanceable, all the principal you pay down on it becomes available on a home equity line of credit, and you can just repeat the cycle. So you can actually use, and we'll go into this more in the next session, but when you borrow on a home equity line of credit or you borrow in general, to pay interest from a debt that is already tax deductible because it's for investment purposes, that new borrowing, so the interest you borrow to pay interest is also tax deductible. So this can allow you to use the home equity line of credit to pay for itself. And when we get into the next session, we're gonna really look at how can you do the strategy with no new money? Because you've always got your mortgage payment. And as you borrow on your home equity line of credit, there's a payment there too. So we're going to look at the kind of the theory and how the real world application works of no new money to implement the strategy. Because it is pretty cool, but it is somewhat situational in the sense that uh, there's a bunch of people joining right now that I think uh, thought we started or didn't realize we started an hour ago. Um, but long story short, you can use the home equity line of credit to cover its cost. And if you have to make an amortized payment on the tax deductible debt, there's ways you can use it to cover itself and make interest only payments. Let's see. And um, Keaton, I'll just add for those that are on this call that um, are new investors, you're just getting started. I'll be the first to admit when I was getting started, I managed to get a uh, mortgage broker who was real estate investor who said to me, we're going to give you a readvanceable mortgage. And I was like, okay, okay. And had no clue what the power of that mortgage could do for me. And I've since just every rental property that I've had, I've had a readvanceable on it. So I think there's something, again, I know we've stressed this a thousand times, but there's something to be said about having power, um, people on your power team that really understand what you want to do long term because it absolutely is to your advantage. And um, I just have to say, Keaton, I am upset that I did not know that strategy that you take your HELOC, pay when you're going to sell a property, damn it. Um, I paid a penalty that I could have probably reduced. And but this, this is, the is other why this. lender yeah. policy matters. I'll, I'll pick on, actually, I won't say it because it's going to go on YouTube and I don't want to get the video pulled down. But there's a lender with a name that has three letters in it. And, and they have prepayment that you're allowed to double your payments and typically you're allowed to do 10% prepayment. The catch, you can only do that 10% prepayment on the anniversary date of the mortgage. So even though they have a really good re-advancing product and they allow five mortgage components and five home equity line of credit components, the pay down privileges suck. And it takes the lender from what would be a nine or 10 out of 10 for the Smith maneuver and brings it to about a five out of 10 because the prepayment is really limited. Not only is it a very small amount, but you can only do it once a year. So it's this is where kind of my world comes in of knowing all these quirky little things. And I always used to stress out about when I do these presentations, like I bounce like a pinball. I stopped caring so much. My goal is to share facts and educate all of you guys. I'm sorry, I'm not the best presenter at like making everything flow perfect. But more, I want to make sure that the wheels start turning, that you start asking questions, 
that you realize there's more to this than just go get a mortgage and ask for a low rate. And there's more to the professionals you work with than were they a pain in the ass? Were they easy to work with? There's actually a level of the advice and the planning they put in. Do they take the time to understand your estate planning needs? Do they have to take the time to understand what your retirement goals are? What your retirement needs are? Simple enough to say, I want to retire in 25 years or 10 years or two years. But what does that mean? Another thing that I always look at is asking the question, Julia, if you did absolutely nothing today, if you made no changes between now and when you plan on retiring, based on your current numbers, what you're doing currently, would you be able to retire? Would you have everything you need? And would additional money, so if you had an extra million dollars in your retirement, would it improve the quality of your retirement or let you do things that are really important to you? Like let's say help kids, family. If the answer is no, extra money wouldn't make any difference to me, then why the hell are you doing this? I'm going to be blunt. Don't take on extra risk if you don't need to. If your life's going to be perfect and you've got a kick-ass pension plan and you've got an inheritance from your parents and you're financially set, and if you had an extra $5 million, it wouldn't make a difference. Maybe your car would be a little bit nicer. Maybe you'd retire six months earlier, but it wouldn't improve what you're going to have, it wouldn't make you happier, then my suggestion to you is instead of trying to make more wealth, try to lower your risk as quick as possible. You're already in a good position. You talk to a financial planner and they've looked ahead and adjusting for inflation and the market changing and all that stuff that can happen. If the assessment is you're on track, don't, don't go borrow a bunch of money to invest. Go do a bunch of extra stuff that's going to complicate your life and potentially stress you out. Just pay it off. Enjoy your life. The problem is that probably 99.9% .9 of Canadians, that's not us. I know it's not me. I know it's not most of my clients. And it doesn't matter if you're a doctor or you're a dentist or you're a plumber. The reality is that probably none of us are going to have what we need and what we want when we retire, particularly when we think about our parents, we think about our kids, we think about our health. So I think that that's where this strategy is really powerful is that, yes, you get more, but it also means that you can help more. And one of the biggest things that drew me to the strategy was my normal savings for retirement was enough that maybe I could invest in the stock market. Maybe I could hope to buy one investment property on the side. The Smith Maneuver made it so that I could invest in the stock market. I could buy real estate. I could look at different estate planning strategies that will save my kids. Well, they'll get millions more because it'll eliminate or cover taxes that I have to pay. And what I liked is, yes, the strategy brings some risk because of leverage, but it also lowered some risk because I was able to broad or broaden or diversify my investment significantly. And I was able to switch from investing in one or two things to becoming a table leg investor and investing in 10 different streams. But have a good night, everyone. See you next Thursday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, 6 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Cheers, everyone.